Modern aerospace vehicles are often inherently unstable, but you wouldn't know it to look at them. Behind the scenes is the enabling technology, an automatic flight control system, or autopilot. Flight control allows aircraft to exploit instability for rapid turns while operating over a wider set of flight conditions and reducing pilot workload. Flight control also allows aircraft to operate unmanned and fly autonomously. This is Flight Control Fundamentals Section 1.1. Here you will learn what a flight control system is, how the first flight control system was invented, its basic components, how flight control led to the first cruise missile, and how fly-by-wire opened a new chapter in flight control technology. Many early aircraft were designed to be inherently stable, but with stability comes less ability to correct course and maintain flight in gusty environments. The Wright brothers took a different approach, designing an aircraft to be unstable but controllable. It was this controllability that would be key to allow the pilot to compensate for the unsteady atmosphere that had plagued previous flight attempts. But as maneuverability increased, so did the workload on the pilot. Pilots were also susceptible to the death spiral or the graveyard spiral. Before we talk about this, let's first cover attitude. Attitude is the orientation of the aircraft with respect to the earth. It's described by the roll angle, the pitch angle, and the yaw angle. The death spiral or spiral dive is dangerous because it develops from steady level flight without the pilot sensing it. The spiraling action that develops is a fundamental characteristic of flight called the spiral mode. The mode occurs with a slow change in roll angle and yaw. While the pilot can often correct the spiral mode due to its slow buildup, human senses do not perceive the spiral without a horizontal reference. In the spiral, altitude decreases and airspeed increases, while the banking aircraft flies a progressively tighter turn until ultimately it's sensed in the seat of the pants of the pilot. At this point, it's too late for correction and ground collision is imminent. This safety concern and the workload that it placed on the pilot would lead Lawrence Sperry to develop the first automatic pilot. Lawrence Sperry was the third son of the famed inventor and entrepreneur Elmer Sperry, father of modern navigation technology. Elmer invented the gyro compass, a device that provides ships geographical direction such as true north. In the gyro compass, Lawrence Sperry recognized an opportunity for flight control the gyroscope. A gyroscope is essentially a spinning rotor mounted in gimbaled rings. It operates on the principle that a body, here the rotor, resists rotation about its spin axis. Therefore, the spinning rotor tends to maintain its attitude in space and becomes a reference for the gimbal rings. If we were to fix the gyroscope on an aircraft, where the joints of the gimbal rings are somehow instrumented, then the gyroscope measures attitude relative to the spinning rotor. And this is the key piece of information that leads to automatic flight control. We can represent the gyroscope as a process that relates the attitude of the vehicle to the gyroscope response. We can also represent the aircraft as a process where control surfaces and external disturbances from the atmosphere determine its attitude. The control surfaces are the rudder, a vertical surface that controls yaw, the elevator, two horizontal surfaces that control pitch, and the aileron, two horizontal surfaces that deflect opposite to control roll. Lawrence Sperry's idea was to control aircraft attitude from the response of a gyroscope, but the gyroscope response would need translation to an appropriate control surface adjustment. In the early 20th century, the most reliable approach was mechanical, 
through cables, linkages, gears, pinions, and other devices, and to come up with their arrangement. Lawrence Sperry is attributed for the first invention of that mechanical device, a gyroscopic stabilizer. It provided continuous mechanical feedback to automatically adjust aircraft control surfaces and maintain a desired attitude. On June 18, 1914, Lawrence Sperry was to demonstrate his autopilot at the airplane safety competition on the banks of the Seine River in France. He integrated his autopilot on a Curtis C-2 aircraft that was adapted with a hydroplane fuselage. Sperry and his newly acquired French mechanic Emil Cashin began their flight as the last entry of the day. In full view of the judges, Standing on the banks of the river as he passed, Sperry had engaged his autopilot, disconnected himself from the shoulder yoke that controlled the ailerons, and raised his hands in the air. Wings level, the aircraft continued on a straight and steady course. On the second pass, Cashin walked seven feet out on the starboard wing, causing the aircraft to briefly bank before automatically leveling itself. Again, the aircraft continued on a straight and steady course. On the third and final pass of the judges, the cockpit was empty, Caution standing on one wing, Sperry on the other. Needless to say, the civilian and military crowd were stunned. A new chapter in aviation and automatic flight control systems had begun. Sperry was awarded $10,000, almost $300,000 today. The Sperry Company would change aviation history for seven decades. It exists today in various U.S. corporations after a series of mergers. In his patent, Mechanical Pilot for Aeroplanes, filed in April of 1916, Lawrence Sperry describes the function of a mechanical autopilot. It's comprised of a sensor and a controller. The gyroscope sensor contains a rotor with a vertical spin axis, gimbal rings, contact pads connected to the gimbal rings, and a brush on the contact pads that is fixed to the aircraft. Hence, attitude is measured through movement of the brush across the contact pads. Aircraft control is accomplished through two handles. Let's focus on the elevator. You'll notice two coupled disks to cabling. This is the so-called lost motion device. It functions as a switch between manual control, where here the connection between handle and elevator adjustment is clear, and automatic control, where the gyroscope is connected to a servo motor via cables, and through appropriate gearing to the elevator. The servo motor is wind powered. It's comprised of counter rotating gear sets and clutch plates that engage to change the direction of flap motion depending on gyroscope feedback. There's even a control surface limiter that halts control action to avoid overcompensation. Note the prominent wind drive of this Sperry autopilot as implemented on this Curtis biplane. After their successful autopilot demonstration, the Sperrys would begin development of an unmanned flying torpedo, a predecessor to modern guided cruise missiles. It was during World War I that the U.S. Navy showed initial interest in this technology for striking German U-boats, but it was the Army that would push the technology forward, having the goal to reach enemies deep behind the front lines of trench warfare. Charles Kettering, an inventor and industrialist from Dayton, Ohio, took on the project to develop a flying bomb, codenamed Liberty Eagle. The bomb was to be expendable, and couldn't cost much more than an artillery shell. 
It must fly in a specified direction, specified distance, and hit a specified target. It must also be assembled in the field by troops with simple tools and minimal experience. To meet technology requirements at low cost, Kettering assembled an all-star team that included Orville Wright, Elmer Sperry, and Henry Ford. The flying bomb would be known as the Kettering Bug. It was 12 feet long, constructed of wood, cloth, paper, and paper mache. The Sperry Company supplied aircraft instruments, including a miniaturized gyro compass for navigation and stabilization and an aneroid barometer for altitude control. Distance was determined by a device that counted engine revolutions, whereby measuring wind direction and speed at launch, the required number of revolutions could be programmed. Once this number was reached, a cam would release the wings, the engine would shut off, and the bomb would fly its ballistic trajectory to the target. In 1918, testing began. Early flights were failures, but nevertheless, they held great value towards progressing the technology. A September flight lasted 300 feet before crashing due to an engine failure. In October, a flight lasted 15 seconds before turning back to dive upon the launchers. The bug finally achieved partial success that month in flying for an extended distance, although it did not meet its guidance objectives. However, later that month of October in 1918, yet another flight would achieve its programmed altitude, fly its programmed distance, and hit its desired target, a complete success. But with the war ending in November, many politicians had little appetite to continue with weapons development. Although the Kettering bug test and evaluation would continue for another year, repeating success was elusive primarily due to motor quality control and flight control tuning issues. The last remaining fine-tuned bug was tested in October 28, 1919. It was a complete success. Nevertheless, the program would come to an end. But similarities to the Kettering bug's construction would be seen in the German V-1 rocket decades later. Germany would launch 10,000 unmanned pilotless V-1 missiles against London in a 10-month period spanning 1944 and 1945. The autopilot was a critical technology that allowed this flying bomb to maintain its course. The V-1 was 27 feet long with a wingspan of 18 feet. It cruised at 360 miles per hour with an Argus pulse jet engine. This gave the weapon its characteristic buzzing sound and led to it being called the buzz bomb. Total range was approximately 150 miles while carrying a 2,000 pound warhead. The V-1 navigated with heading measurements via magnetic compass in the nose cone. The autopilot controlled altitude, airspeed, and attitude. It was powered through two spherical tanks that contained compressed air at 900 PSI. Both the gyroscopes and control surfaces were actuated with the compressed air. The control architecture was cleverly constructed so that all three axes of flight were actually controlled through just the elevators and rudder. An odometer preset before flight and driven by a vane anemometer, a small propeller at the nose tip, counted down the distance to the target. Every 30 rotations of the anemometer propeller counted down one on the odometer. When the countdown reached zero, the V1 turned into a steep dive. This starved the engine of fuel, causing it to shut off. To Londoners, this was heard as its characteristic buzzing sound upon approach, followed by what must have been a terrifying period of silence before explosion. Automatic flight control was not exclusive to the V-1. This electrical fitter is making adjustments to George, a common name for the automatic pilot at the time on a Halifax bomber. Electronics would become more prevalent in flight control after World War II. By this time, what a pilot would deem acceptable handling qualities was known and established as a standard requirement. But as jet engine technology pushed aircraft into wider ranges of speed and altitude, establishing consistent handling qualities became a challenge with mechanical control systems. 
mechanical flight control design over the increasing operational envelope through pulleys, levers, gears, and other mechanical subcomponents would lead to a heavy flight control system that took up significant space. The solution was to replace the predominantly mechanical flight control system with an electric one. This led to the so-called fly-by-wire flight control system. To understand fly-by-wire, let's first look at the general architecture of the control system for a piloted aircraft. Starting with the pilot who attempts to change the state of the aircraft through the manual controls, such as a stick. The output of the stick is a command to change aircraft state, such as attitude or acceleration. That is input to the flight controller or autopilot. The flight controller produces the appropriate control surface adjustment command that is input to the control actuation system. The control actuation system adjusts the control surfaces according to the flight control command, thereby changing the state of the aircraft. The aircraft response is fed back through two channels. In the inner loop, a sensor, such as a gyroscope, feeds back the aircraft response data to the flight controller. This loop is known as the stability augmentation system. The outer loop is the aircraft response as perceived by the pilot. Note that the stability augmentation system will strongly play a role in the perception of the handling qualities of the aircraft. Where in the general control architecture does fly-by-wire occur? The answer is between the cockpit control and the control actuation system. To fully fly-by-wire is to make the process between the output of the cockpit controls and the input to the control actuation system fully electronic. That is, electric signals are passed through wires relaying the aircraft state command to the flight controller. The flight controller is an electronic circuit, potentially a computer, that transforms the electronic aircraft state command into an electronic control surface command. Finally, the control surface command is transmitted as an electronic signal by wire to the control actuation system. Sperry's gyroscopic pilot was almost purely mechanical, but actually some electronics were involved. For example, recall that an aircraft referenced brush moved across contact pads fixed to the gyro gimbal rings. The resulting electric signal was used to adjust a clutch plate that automatically changed control surface direction in the flight controller as needed. The control surface adjustment was transmitted through tension cables to the control surfaces. Two decades after Sperry's autopilot invention, a portion of the fly-by-wire process would be incorporated in the Tupolev An T-20, a massive Soviet six-engine aircraft that was 112 feet long with a wingspan of 206 feet. In this aircraft, long runs of mechanical linkages or hydraulic lines that would be necessary to transmit control surface commands from the flight controller were instead replaced with wires and electric servo motors. The first non-experimental debut of full fly-by-wire was in 1957 on the Avro Canada CF-105 Aero. The CF-105 was to serve the Royal Canadian Air Force into the 1960s and beyond. Powered by Pratt & Whitney J-75 turbo engines, the Delta Wing Interceptor's flight envelope included speeds up to Mach 2 and altitudes up to 50,000 feet. Its wide set of operating conditions made fly-by-wire an attractive approach to flight control. The CF-105 incorporated pressure-sensitive transducers in the stick that sent electronic commands to the hydraulic control actuation system. As control surface loads varied according to aircraft speed and altitude, a separate control system was devised based on CAS back pressure to give the stick appropriate feel. This was the first artificial feel feedback loop for the pilot. The stability augmentation system provided artificial damping of the aircraft modes 
through inertial measurement unit feedback. The pilot was generally unaware of the stability augmentation operating behind the scenes, but this would contribute to the excellent reported handling qualities of the aircraft. Fly-by-wire flight control relied on analog processing up until the Apollo Lunar Lander program in the 1960s, which implemented a digital fly-by-wire control system. NASA recognized the implications of digital fly-by-wire to commercial aerospace technology. They first demonstrated the feasibility of digital fly-by-wire on a modified Vought F-8 Crusader. The use of a digital computer for fly-by-wire offered many new valuable opportunities, including the ability to efficiently incorporate redundancies for automatic autopilot reconfiguration during in-flight system failures. Also, the ability to employ advanced control methods through digital implementation that would otherwise be impractical on analog circuits. And finally, overall reduced cost, weight, and volume allowed by the digital fly-by-wire flight control system. In the first phase of the effort, NASA utilized the digital hardware and software of the Apollo Lunar Landing Vehicle a system that still had a highly trained support team and a 70,000 hour mean time before failure record. Between 1972 and 73, a total of 58 hours of phase one flight time would be completed. Most of this time, the pilot operated the aircraft using the digital fly-by-wire system, while 14 hours were testing of the redundant backup system. Here we can see the digital controller, where electronic stick commands are input through a digital computer to produce electronic control actuation commands. This architecture shows the digital fly-by-wire system for phase one, where the overarching goal was to show feasibility and develop confidence in the approach. The architecture was comprised of a primary system, a backup system designed by the Sperry Flight Controls Division, the center stick was the main means of control for both the primary and backup systems. When the stick was disconnected from the mechanical cables for fly-by-wire, it resulted in undesirable looseness. Therefore, a simple mechanical feel system in the form of a damper was added for both stick and rudder pedals. The original Apollo inertial measurement unit was used to avoid unnecessary modification of the Apollo computer. This IMU measured acceleration and attitude and was the raw source of aircraft state feedback data for flight control. Both the stick output and IMU data are input to the Apollo digital computer. Therein, control service commands are computed with the programmed control laws. These control laws can be basic or can be quite advanced, and that flexibility is allowed because the implementation is digital. The 1960s Apollo computer could perform the control law calculations in 30 milliseconds, while this was slow even for the 1970s, it was still much faster than human processing and allowed NASA to efficiently achieve the digital fly-by-wire feasibility assessment. The Apollo computer had two outputs, a monitor channel and an active channel. Those two channels were continuously compared throughout operation. If a discrepancy arose between the two, it indicated an error and the flight control system automatically switched to the backup system. The active system is the primary controller under normal circumstances. The digital control surface commands are converted to an analog signal. Then the analog control surface command is input into the analog control actuation system stabilization block. That is, the stabilization block and the original 
FHC hydraulic actuator are the closed loop control actuation system. This NASA diagram corresponds to this portion of the generalized control loop architecture shown earlier. The NASA digital fly-by-wire effort successfully laid the groundwork for digital fly-by-wire technology transition in two phases spanning 1971 to 1977. Today, digital fly-by-wire is the standard on modern commercial aircraft and it remains highly relevant to aerospace system technologies in general, as it allows the implementation of advanced flight control architectures. This is Flight Control Fundamentals, Section 1.1.